Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and I'm here today with Meher Roy. And today we're going to speak with Timlak Miptev, who is the founder of Ukbar. Ukbar is a ZK rollup, an Ethereum ZK rollup that's built on Urbit. And, you know, probably a lot of people are going to be like, what the hell? So we're going to like uncover all that and, you know, get to the bottom and hopefully you'll come away with uh, an understanding of what Ukbar is up to, which is pretty exciting. So thanks so much for joining us, Tim Luck. Yeah, it's great to, great to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Cool. Well, um, maybe she'll also make a brief disclaimer here. So Meher and I, of course, uh, are co-founders of Course One, and uh, we have invested in Ukbar. Uh, and also personally, and have been sort of involved in partnership with them as well. So I want to mention that. Not, um, not that much, though. So A little bit, a little bit. You get just a minor, <laughs> minor, minor disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. I'm actually, one thing I'm curious about is, did you first get involved in crypto or in Urbit? And what was sort of this journey that you had into this into this world? Okay. So the answer, it's actually like a better question even than it sounds. Cause I think the answer is first into crypto for sure. So I was like one of the people who bought Bitcoin near the top in 2013 at the end and was like sort of into it sort of around. And like, I remember actually in 2016 getting back in and like investing in it then and actually listening to Epicenter at the time. I remember taking like random walks around. I think it was in Estonia or something, cool. a small town, <laughs> listening, listening to Epicenter, trying to sort of boot myself back up on um, where crypto was at then. And as that year went and through like the ICO boom, I was like programming in Solidity, doing a lot of stuff there. And I think um, I actually remember encountering Urbit then, uh, sort of looking it over and doing the thing that I sometimes do, which is something I try to stop myself from doing, which is sort of dismissing it too fast for a simple reason or dismissing things too fast for a simple reason. So I looked at it and I was like, oh, this is cool. I see what they're trying to do in terms of having this you know, global peer-to-peer -peer network that can coordinate easily. But I can probably just do that with Ethereum. Like, I think this was at a time before... Uh, it, like in 2018, if you remember, Ethereum just had all these scaling issues that were unanticipated, uh, like with Plasma and stuff like that. And people ran into a lot of challenges there. And But in 2016, 2017, it was like, okay, probably we'll figure this out. This will be great. I think also at the time, the challenges of kind of stitching together peer-to-peer -to -peer apps with lots of pieces weren't known. So with all that, I was like... I get what Urbit's going for, but you know, I think Ethereum is new. Um, it's like seems to be on track to solve those things. If not it, some other similar like blockchain system. And so I basically just put Urbit to the side to then and did not look at it again until I think it was late 2019. Must have been October or so. Okay, cool. And then you joined. Uh, so and then you joined Tlon as well. Like, what's the story of how you ended up uh, at Tlon? Yeah. So. I got back into Urbit or checked it out again, not even back in. I wasn't in at first in late 2019 because one of my friends who was friends with Ravnus Rickfer, one of the main core developers at Talon, was like, oh, yeah, I'm hanging out with, you know, Ted Ravnus Rickfer. He's really into Urbit um, and doing it, but I think it's stupid and it's not going to work. So then I checked it out again at that point just to see where it was. I had more free time and I was just like an outside community member. Um, I started, I got really into it in May, 2020, uh, during like the COVID stuff when I had a lot of free time, I started first, uh, figuring out how their sort of assembly language knock worked, wrote a tutorial about that, then decided like, okay, I want to write a tutorial for how to just write programs on the system in general. Cause there wasn't anything like that. So did that on my own as a community member at this time, there were probably like four or five community programmers who weren't working for Tron in Urbit. It was very small. Uh, kept doing that over the summer. Um, then Coin Wallet in late 2020, mid 2020, something like that. Um, and after I sort of finished up with that in the beginning of 2021, I joined what became the Urbit Foundation. So it wasn't exactly Tron. I was working for like uh, Josh, who's now the head of the Urbit Foundation, kind of was like, do you want to come with me and sort of be, I guess, more or less technical director? 
of this new foundation where you sort of, you know, figure out um, things in the ecosystem, um, like help people on board, show them how to program it, figure out what kind of technical resources to make. And so I did that for most of 2021. And I think the biggest sort of achievement of that time was like, uh, up until then, all the people who knew how to write Urbit practically, or most of them were working for Talon. And it was very much like in order to program Urbit, you had to become a Talon employee or very closely affiliated and kind of be taught uh, the secrets. And I think what we did successfully is we were able to kind of prove the hypothesis that you could onboard programmers to Urbit uh, fairly straightforwardly. And there wasn't anything overly complex about it, which people definitely worried about. Uh, before then. So yeah, I never worked for Talon, but I guess at that time the foundation and Talon were so close and the foundation was just splitting off that, you know, I may as well have. I was on like their, um, you, you know, all hands calls and things like that, but we were very much trying to make this like outside thing that would be able to successfully onboard people without them needing to go and work for Talon. And I think, um, you know, looking back, it's just a very proud achievement. Like it, it worked. Like, you know, the, the foundation became its own thing soon after I left. Um, people keep learning it. There's way more, you know, when I started, there were a, a few, like five Urbit programmers not in Talon. Now there's probably a couple hundred. So yeah, that was what I did. And I was, yeah, pretty happy with how it all went, like more so than most things go in life. You know, so we've done a few podcasts about Urbit. We did the podcast actually a long time ago in 20. 17, I think, Meher and I did a podcast with Galen, which is sort of how we, you know, learned about Urbit and got kind of involved a little bit. And then more recently, we did one, or I did one with Josh uh, that you just mentioned, who's the executive director of the Urbit Foundation, and then also did one with uh, with Tilla Tolbos and uh, with, uh, who you mentioned, uh, Ted, uh, who's the technical director of the foundation. So with that being said, still, most people right in crypto don't really understand Urbit. They're confused. So um, how do you explain Urbit? Like, There's kind of two directions that you can come at it from. One is sort of taking Urbit and saying how this has good features for crypto and how it works well. I actually prefer the other direction, which is you take crypto and you start to say, okay, why do we not have very rich like dApps? Um, what's standing between us and there? And what do we wish we had to make better ones? And I think as you do work through that, you almost start to independently invent Urbit. Like, you know, Leibniz and Newton, like both doing calculus, like on the side, you can actually sort of reinvent Urbit in this way, which is you say like, okay, we don't have great dApps. Why is that? Well, let's look at what kind of dApps are successful. Um, definitely like the biggest successes are things like, um, like swapping and lending by far, like, uh, Aave, Uniswap, things like that. And there's, there's, uh, we could also look at, uh, NFT, like trading protocols, like OpenSea or Blur. And in all these cases, almost all of the interesting action is happening on chain. Uh, like Uniswap is like amazing because they were actually able to take something that people thought had to be done mostly off chain and get it all on chain. Similarly with like the lending protocols and how they handle, you know, liquidations and things like that, um, which is very, very cool. The thing is, in all of this, they're trying not to have heavy off chain components, which I think if you talk to people in Ethereum and crypto in general, like in like the Cosmos ecosystem, like probably seven, eight years ago, they would have said, you know what, we all know that like blockchains have this limited capacity. So we're expecting going forward that, uh, that we'll find ways to do lots of action off chain and then settle the main things on chain. And, and to some degree, if you even look at like the like successful L2s, they've done that where they've been able to do like do that somewhat. But in general for applications, it's very, very hard because the problem at the end of the day is if you want your application to be decentralized, not even for like religious reasons or like, you know, privacy reasons, but just for, you know, if you do a centralized service, it's easy to shut down. You can't offer all the features you want. It's harder to iterate on. If you want to do a decentralized app, you now have to distribute this app to all of your users and keep them up to date in the right versions, handle all this stuff. And if you don't do that or it falls apart at all, it's just kind of gross. And so because that's so hard, I think people thought it's hard, like, okay, some whiny engineers need to work harder for three or four months, but it's hard, like, stuff takes years 
or just doesn't happen at all. And so if you want to solve that, when I say that you would sort of reinvent Urbit, you start to think of things like, okay, I need to have some kind of operating system that I can guarantee or some kind of virtual machine that all of these, you know, spread out peers are running so that at least when I deliver them software, I know they're talking to each other in the right way. They can handle versions changing well. They can get it distributed cleanly. They can know who the other peers are and their networking IDs, not just their like crypto IDs. And you start to go sort of further and further and you end up basically reinventing Urbit, which is a peer-to-peer -peer operating system that's just trying to make it so that you can predictably say what all these different nodes in your network are running and how you can deliver software to them. And so I think kind of the proof of that is it took us a while, but as we built out with Ukbar, this kind of crypto layer on top of Urbit, where you can start to like actually realize this and be like, okay, we're, you know, we're having applications, um, we're delivering them easy, easily to people, we're letting them compose off chain and then do their high value things on chain. It actually is working like better, even maybe than we would have thought. So the way, if we kind of step all the way back and say how I would explain it to people, it's that if you actually want to have cool, rich dApps that kind of drive the new meta of crypto, like the new narratives that push people in, uh, you need to take a step back and engineer something a lot like a peer-to-peer -peer operating system. So if someone in the last five or six years had built something like Urbit in another language or in a sort of another stack, I actually probably would be looking at it. And we would probably be hedging our bets in Ukbar and like, developing on that thing as well or making sure we knew it the thing is no one's like no one's done it it's like a daunting project that's hard to do and at the point where someone does, starts doing it i will take it very very seriously i just don't think it will happen until urban and ukbar prove concept enough that that becomes like economically desirable like where investors are think okay we just saw that work now we're gonna you know throw we're, we're fine to throw money at you i'm actually curious if you could take a like a practical example of, of what you're saying, like, like let's imagine like a, a dApp that does X and then we put something on the blockchain and be like, okay, what are the constraints that emerge and why do we need a sort of an off-chain operating system? Is, is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll take an example that I don't think is super advanced or exciting or just like the the start of what we can do. But when we were playing around in November, December and wanted to be like, okay, what can we show people for what this is doing? We're like, okay, let's make a poker game. And what does that involve practically? If you want to make it peer to peer, uh, you need to have, let's leave aside mental poker for now or some advanced algorithm. Let's say you want to have a server uh, that kind of decides timeouts in the game, who won, etc. You want, you know, at least two players who connect to that server. Uh, you want them to be able to put money in escrow before, you know, each match. And you want it to get paid out appropriately. So suddenly you're looking at all these operations that sound easy, but everything I said there hides a lot of complexity, which is first deploy the server. Right. If you're if you want it to be running all the time, you would have to maybe deploy it to like a cloud service or something like that, configure it, make sure it's running, then have that connect to a blockchain, be able to take events coming in from people who say, here's like the money that I want to put up and like lock it until uh, the end, have like those people read those events. And this is all doable in you know a basic web3 format but when you start putting all the pieces together the friction gets quite bad both from okay this server isn't working i want to make my own let's go deploy that oh now i'm following all these instructions for how to deploy it in the cloud that's actually quite complicated with urbit it's it was it's literally like you know push a button to say install the hosting software push another button and now it's running and so when we actually had one go down and I wanted to start up another one for our test games, uh, it was actually like remarkably easy and just sort of slots in. Then you go to everything about, you know, we want to deliver updates easily. Uh, Urbit lets us handle that to all the peers so they can stay, they can stay synced. And then we can even start doing, and then even the wallet interactions where you're like, okay, I need to send money uh, to the escrow, then have it be detected, have that come back. That's like, something that you want to have done like pretty seamlessly. And by putting it inside Urbit, we're able to have that happening all, you know, on our back end when 
the action happens, you can spit it out. And the end result at the end of the day is you have something that just works. Now we're expanding that a lot to actually a use case that I think is much more practical and close to home, which is we wrote, um, we have chat and we're expanding it now to, I guess, something that is, it it basically becomes DAO tooling, but in a very full featured way where you're like, when you say, what is a group of people? Excuse me. Um, In Urbit, it's traditionally been, okay, I have one server and that server keeps a list of who's in the group and you do that. But there's no reason that that can't be an on-chain entity, that it couldn't be like a DAO or some kind of group that records its various permissions or members or things like that, um, you know, on-chain. The only thing is you have to be able to easily query that. You have to be able to update it, let all that stuff happen. And we're going to release that pretty soon, but in a format where you can basically say my DAO is an on-chain thing, but all of this off-chain stuff like chat, uh, documents, like blogs, people are sharing, sending money doing applications that involve assets sort of just works based on the permissions of that DAO. So I think um, it's those are some of the concrete examples, but I think the coolest thing about it is that all of them extend very, very easily. And it's almost like all the stuff that is either a sort of a programmer who hasn't done Web3 and thinks stuff should be doable, now it is, stuff that you intuitively think, or as a user, where users will often think this stuff about, okay, I have all these things, why can't I combine them? Like I have a chain that could store this DAO state, why can't that also integrate easily with, they would think like, you know, my Telegram groups and manage permissions there, or do things like that, or, and now it can. So I think that that's really the main answer is all the, like we can keep giving these concrete examples, but they extend easily and all the stuff you think you should be able to do kind of naively, uh, you can. So in your, in your personal story, you told about the time when you dismissed Urbit and then, and then you revisited Urbit again, worked with the Urbit Foundation. And then how did you end up at the idea for Ukbar and yeah, how did you end up finding the team for it? Yes. So this part is the idea was actually very straightforward because all of 2021, I was dealing with people coming to Urbit and saying, I want to learn how to build the system and I want to try to do this kind of project. Like actually, I was just describing the poker game that we did in Ukbar. That was actually the apprentice project of the guy who's now our lead developer. He came and was like, okay, I want to see if I can quickly make uh, a poker game on Urbit. And just taking that as an example, what happened is he was able to do it very quickly, handling all those pure aspects I talked about. But you know, poker is kind of boring without real money. And the kind of step that he got to was how do I have there be real, like, you know, real money in here? And the answer was, "Ah, you have to do all this kind of gross stuff interopping with, you know, an outside, an outside blockchain. And that was not an isolated case. I would, I would say like probably 90% of the projects people did when they came to Urbit sort of spiritually wanted to be crypto projects. They wanted to have, especially because when you're dealing with these like decentralized uh, applications, you very, very often want them to be able to coordinate on some piece of state or have some kind of economically meaningful thing, update, something like that. And so people over and over again wanted that. And the answer was always, ah, you could do it, but we've kind of sold you on this like amazing operating system that integrates everything inside it, except for crypto. That's not like integrated. You have to kind of go through this sort of gross process all over again. And so it became very, very clear that Urbit needed a, in, I'll say like an integrated crypto system. And the question was, I think it was obviously desirable. There were questions over how to achieve it, but we basically started the project by finding everyone in Urbit who was interested in that idea and was good at stuff um, and saying, you know, we probably have a job for you if we can you know, raise money against this idea. And because I think a lot of the people who were in Urbit at the time got that. It was this very almost like funding of early ETH thing where a lot of people sort of saw the desirability of this, were in like a community and decided to, you know, get in on it. And so we were able to fund it based on them sort of understanding Urbit and what it would need. And then there were a number of people around. Uh, we, we hired like, I'm trying to think how many on our team, like m- most of our dev team is people who I was working with as like sort of new programmers to Urbit during that year 
or who I onboarded. Um, and same with people on our like um, business team or people who got interested in it from other, you know, from the like this, something is going on here and I want to be in on the community uh, aspect. So, and then we had some really great people who had been heavily involved, like working at Tlon, like, um, like Tackwright Socripe, uh, like Logan Allen, um, who worked with us like part-time to onboard all of our people and kind of get them really up to speed in writing Hoon, in writing Urbit programs. Uh, he did a great job and has since gone on to sort of take the crypto side and the, that side even farther by starting a ZK-oriented Urbit company that's doing really well, um, Zorp. And yeah, it was just this like, I think we kind of collected everyone who was talented, interested in crypto, uh, just getting into Urbit and wanted to just like sort of be in on that. And we, at that point we were like, okay, we have some team, we have some money. Now we sort of have to figure out how all this will work. And that was sort of its own. We've, we've gone through a lot of different sort of changes and ideas since it started. Well, let's get a little bit into the details here, right? So, cause you're basically saying like, okay, in Urbit, right? You have a lot of things that are just part of the stack, right? So you have, uh, you know, identity messaging, a lot of things are just like in there, software distribution. And I was saying, okay, the goal, the goal of Bookbar making crypto part of the stack as well. Like, what does it mean? Because it, because in the end, right, these other things are actually part of the core Urbit like operating system. Whereas Ukbar is something that's building on top. So what does it mean to sort of, you know, make crypto <laughs> uh, this like, yeah, this part of the Urbit stack where there's like fundamental primitive that's like easily available for people building Urbit applications? I've thought about that a lot because you definitely ask yourself while you're doing a project, like, for, like is what I'm doing necessary? is definitely a, bi a big thing. And so I, when I was giving the stories earlier about people wanting crypto in their apps, but not having it, that was sort of to motivate that. But practically how you make it a part of it is you make sure that everything Ukbar does as a chain, and I'll, I'll explain this in sort of high level technical where it's easy to understand, but just at the, even without technical to start, everything it does is like Urbit native. So let's say you have a, I think most people in your audience would be familiar with like L2 sequencers. So you have this machine sitting there that's taking, you know, transactions and then settles them with whatever chain it's, let's say, rolling up to, right? Uh, so Ukbar has a sequencer. We have it set up actually so you can have multiple sequencers. It's actually pretty similar to, you know, how Arbitrum has proposed doing multiple, you know, multiple chains that interop. So it has its sequencer and that sequencer has to interact with Ethereum, but no one else inside the Urbit network has to interact with Ethereum. Everything that that sequencer does is like, you know, an airlock that's sealed off tight and you can send it interact and all the interactions you do with it sort of produce urbit native data urbit native events that are easy for urbit programs to handle so that doesn't mean that we're exclusive like someone else could go and make something like ukbar where so we're not exclusive in the way that something in the kernel if you could actually imagine a version of urbit where they basically built ukbar as like a core part of the operating system i don't think that would be the best design because you may as well, there's no technical reason for it. And so you may as well compete on that layer. But we do have to compete with anyone who wants to do the exact same thing as us in their own thing. Uh, although we do have like, you know, business licensing on the code. So they wouldn't be able to just copy us in most cases. They could try to make a really good layer for calling out to like, you know, Ethereum or Cosmos or ETH layer twos or something like that. Um, they absolutely could do that. It's hard. It's, it's like a lot of engineering. So I think what makes us crypto on urbit is that we're the only people who are doing it particularly seriously right now and who have anything remotely well engineered there and we're also doing all the engineering such that from a developer's perspective you don't have to think about how it interacts with like let's say like ethereum or anything like that everything is like fully contained inside urbit in this model right so basically a developer can write their application right and so in 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 Urbit, there's a programming language called Hoon, right? Which is sort of the, the main development language, is this functional language. So, and, and you can build your Urbit application in Hoon. And so basically what you guys are then offering is that as I'm writing this application, I can write some sort of smart contract logic uh, in that application in Hoon. And then it will sort of like, you know, can like 
create a transaction. It can, you know, and, and it will send that transaction to the sequencer, which is again, just a Urbit, uh, it's just on Urbit, right? So just sending a message to basically a particular uh, ship on Urbit. An Urbit node. An Urbit node, yeah. And then that Urbit node kind of sequences it. And in the end, it settles to Ethereum. So you have sort of the security of Ethereum. And at the same time, yeah, you, you can kind of access that smart contract functionality from within normal uh, Urbit app. That's right. And we could get more into the Urbit app side because there is this question of why are you doing all this work so that you can, let's say, write smart contracts in Hoon and integrate them with Urbit apps? Like what's the win there? I think we've sort of, we've sort of touched on that. But that's, that's another big part of the story where I guess one, the way I would say it is right now when you develop, let's say, Ethereum contracts or EVM in general, you use something like Hard Hat or something like that. And you get this full environment that lets you do all this testing and stuff for your on-chain application. So we talked like, you know, maybe 20 minutes ago about how um, for just on-chain stuff, uh, the current paradigm works pretty well. You can make some pretty some pretty cool apps that work that work well. And I guess the one way you can think about what we're doing is trying to extend that feeling of being inside, you know, hard hat or the foundry, what's the rust one, like foundry, like something like that, and extending that to your entire application. So that when you want to test your, you know, full application and say it's getting, you know, events coming in from other peers or starting them up, having the blockchain events coming in too is also part of that. So really trying to unify everything into this whole. And we wouldn't be able to do that if we weren't writing it, um, you know, as one urban application. If, if you didn't have that, if it was just the Ookbar chain and then you were writing with all in JavaScript or something, that would be very hard. And if it was just urban apps and you were, had to interface with them in like, you know, native EVM form, that would also be very hard. And the way we, the reason we know that's hard is that urban people have wanted to do this for a while and like they haven't. And blockchain people have wanted these kind of, you know, very rich apps for a while and also have had a very hard time doing them. Whereas we're starting to find this like intersection to be like a lot easier and sort of, you know, more fun to write. Let me dig into this a little bit. So our story starts off with kind of just observing that, for example, if we wanted a poker, poker app, the hard thing about building a poker app on Ethereum is, well, the financial logic, there's a natural house for that financial logic, but poker also requires, um, it's a game of incomplete information. I need to have some secrets from you and secrets are not naturally supported in uh, on, on the blockchain. So I, I need something with privacy and lacking uh, and what might be something with privacy? Well, you might say that, okay, the user's browser is, is something that has, has privacy. So we could have the application run on two users' browsers, and then it, they, they, they settle on Ethereum. Maybe somebody could imagine something like that. And yeah, I think, I think even, you know, Virtue Poker or True Poker, we're pretty much doing things like this. Like, I don't want the people in our audience to scream at us. Like, I know what mental poker is. You absolutely, there, there are ways to solve it. I think Mayor's point is more about the logistics. Yeah, yeah, but... Of course, like when you when you start to do do that, you you come to the realization that you are almost trying to use the browser as kind of like a computer, right? Uh, you're trying to do peer-to-peer -peer networking between users, uh, between two browsers, and then what if you had a persistent, long-lived computer rather than a browser to represent the the user, and like that's kind of that's kind of um, Urbit's, Urbit's jump. In fact, if we go back to the beginning of the discussion where we said you almost independently reinvent Urbit, you're about like, you know, 10% of the way to reinventing Urbit already because you start to say, yeah, this would be great. Okay, I'm going to put like, you know, the applications living in my user's browser. Okay, now they need ways to talk to each other. Uh, okay, we'll make like, you know, a stack for that. They also need to be able to know like the identity of the other one and like encrypt it and make sure they're doing that man, my app also might have some like software updates over time. Like I better make sure they're running the same version of the operating system. And, and what you do is, and I'm not saying this in a bad way, you actually absolutely could make sort of a version of something like Urbit or an OS that lived in browsers. This is basically what people want to do with Wasm. It's just that no one's done it. 
And so <laughs> like Urbit is the only thing out there that is in a form that can be used, but you're absolutely right that you start to go down this road of needing to maintain the software, deploy it somewhere, have places it can talk to to handle identity, um, networking between the things. And that's all the stuff that Urbit is giving us for free. And then what we need to make sure we can do is in that model, um, also have it be as clean as possible for those, let's say, in-browser programs uh, to talk to the blockchain and do that cleanly. Because right now, Urbit is the sort of sealed off thing where it can do all of that stuff and solve all those problems, but it doesn't have like, without Ukbar, particularly clean ways to talk to talk to the blockchain. And so that's been a barrier for, you know, on the Urbit side, it's been logistically difficult to develop those kinds of programs. Yeah, and then now the next step you're, you're taking is really that the development environment that works to develop applications in natively in Urbit should be the same as the development environment that you use to build your smart contracts running on a blockchain on Urbit. Yes. And like that's the that's the that's the unification you're trying to do because in the end what you want is for the developer to to have very little difference between something that is on blockchain and like something that is that is exactly. Longer. And we can even go further, which is in terms of what we're developing internally, which is we, we, um, we want the blockchain to be inside Urbit. We want the program to be an Urbit native program. And we even want the testing and orchestration of those. Like, let's say if you're testing and you want to, you're, you're testing a poker game, you need to have three or four different fake peers running, fake nodes running to test it and keep doing them. We also want to get that running inside Urbit. So right now it's run, if you're actually building an Urbit program, the way it looks is maybe you fire up four different terminal windows and each of them is one of your nodes, you know, your sort of fake nodes that you're testing with and you have to cut and paste commands into them to get them into the right states as you develop it. And so one insight we had, which is not unique to us, Talon had started some work on this a while but never took it that far, was what if we put all of that inside Urbit? What if we have an, you know, an Urbit program that can create four or five, whatever, different Urbit like nodes and an Urbit blockchain, an Ukbar blockchain inside and run, you know, sort of run all this stuff and let you sort of automate that app development process. So again, it actually feels very much like, you know, for any of our EVM developers here, if you use something like hard hat where you fire up a local uh, node and run stuff against it and then reset it, it feels like that. But for everything in your application where you're almost simulating this, you know, galaxy of different peers uh, who you put into whatever states you want and run through a program and then the next obvious step after that that we've just started to look into is uh, sort of further powering that up at the next level will be to like, you know, integrate like AI assistance with it is like a very obvious next step because the thing we haven't, that you haven't asked me yet is, but isn't sort of hoon weird and how will you get developers to use it? And so there, there are some answers to that even without that, but we're seeing some really promising uh, avenues with, you know, training like LLMs uh, to know, basically to know Hoon better and kind of let people do it the lazy way rather than having to take this sort of religious journey into a new programming language. Okay, great. I, did, I Exactly. I wanted to ask about that question, right? So because Hoon is something that when people see it first, it looks really weird. It doesn't look like any other programming language. So a lot of people, you know, including let's, let's say Chorus 1, right? But basically... Uh, Hoon looks like very strange. And uh, for people, it, one of the most common objections, you know, we get is like people see that and it's like, well, people are not going to want to learn this thing, right? So you really have to do something that's more close to programming languages that developers already know. Uh, that's the only way to get like mainstream adoption and get like, you know, hundreds of thousands of developers building on it. And of course you have like Solidity, which is kind of like JavaScript similar uh, and, and so that's a very, very common objection. And then, of course, you have a lot of people in Urbit that are like, no, who's the way? And like, <laughs> once you learn it, there's no going back. And it is the one, you know, the one true thing. Even within Urbit, right, there's a little bit of like division where you had like, uh, I guess, the project uh, Holium, right, has now been trying to get more like JavaScript into Urbit. So what's what is your thought uh, on, on Hoon? and sort of its suitability for application development, mainstream adoption, and smart contract development. 
Okay, so there's a, we can we, we can use the stuff we've talked about already to kind of frame this. So first of all, I'm kind of an urbit atheist. Uh, I'm not religious about it. I'm doing this in a very sort of 20th century empirical scientific sense where I'm using it because it has specific properties that I want. And to the, if there's principles, uh, I, I sort of like them because they help me develop better. I'm not you know, religiously, intellectually married to like having to have weird characters on the screen. That doesn't, you know, it's like sort of, it's a fun thing, but it doesn't matter to me that much. So if we start out, like, why are we using Hoon? The first reason is that like th practically right now, that's the only way to get access to the urban operating system. And as we said earlier, the urban operating system is the only thing that has these properties that we need in order to cleanly build these systems. But then, as Brian said, that leads into the next question of, okay, you can have all your reasons, but will people use it? So I think there's two angles to come here from that are very, like, we have a lot of empirical evidence as to how this goes. So the first angle we can go from is, have people become more likely to learn Hoon over time? And as I said, I think people don't really appreciate this who are in Urbit, but because um, a lot of them are either have come in the last two years or when they were there earlier, sort of weren't directly involved with education. But I can tell you for a fact that if we were talking about like June 2020, I would have long conversations with people. And the subject of those conversations was, is it possible to teach normal developers to use Hoon or is it just too hard and too weird? And my hypothesis was, it's not too hard. It's just being taught badly. And some people thought it was sort of, you know, too hard and they had to go through the secret like cult, like initiation to want to in the first place. And the it's not too hard people have won hands down convincingly. So we now have like, you know, when the foundation runs people through Hoon School, there'll be like 100 to 200 people doing that a pop. There's way more, you know, Hoon repos on GitHub than there were. There's far more Hoon programmers like than there were, there's not even enough jobs for them, like necessarily. There's probably not as many companies as there are them. And the biggest issue people have now is like, I think because it's missing stuff like crypto, it's almost like, okay, what do they build once they have this? So that's one angle is that I think um, Hoon is not particularly hard to learn, but you are correct that it's still a new language. And what's the point of learning a new language and you have to convince developers to do it? So I think there's, again, two aspects there. The first one is, if we think about right now um, for sort of non-EVM L2 stuff uh, or even L1s, there's a couple projects and they're very, very successful. Um, if we take like, obviously, like you have Solana, which uses Rust. Um, been, now, that's already an existing language. So they get to onboard people who know that. Uh, but then you have Starknet, which has is probably sort of the most um, nerd sniping developer attracting like projects like, you know, in crypto, it's like very like they get a lot of developers and sort of organic attention and people wanting to do it, even though the language is way harder than Hoon, especially to reason about doesn't look like they, they've made it some superficial things to make it look different, but it's very hard to think about and people still use it and they still will do it because it lets them do something that they want to do. And I think Ukbar is very much in that vein of, if we can let you do the types of apps that we think we can, you'll go through the work of using Hoon. That said, so that would have been my answer until about, you know, March 15th or 20th or something like that. And now because we're living in like the singularity, like GPT-4 came out, everyone's on what it can do and can see how this is going to head for other like, you know, LLMs and people have been making a ton of progress in, um, you know, training non-GPT. LLMs and doing like do like Llama and things like that. And it's very, very obvious that if we put the work in, we will be able to have computers that make it much, much easier for you to write in Hoon and let you get in, like sort of have a superficial understanding of it, but be like, do this for me or show me how this is done and things like that. And I think, so we start, basically we start with this thing of, can you learn Hoon? Yes, it's possible to learn Hoon and it's not particularly hard as languages go. Uh, do you have desire to? We've seen that if there's enough like economic reason, there's like um, because we're providing enough applications that you can build, that will be there. And then can we make that as easy as possible? And the main worry now is that like, you know, I guess it's interesting. I think actually the main competitor of sort of Ukbar type stuff now is actually super powerful LLMs 
that let you take all the stuff that Mayer was saying is hard and like gluing together things or putting in a browser and just make it. Like essentially, I think the only way to sort of make that stuff go really well is like maybe maybe even AGI or something like close to it. And we can see a path to that now. But, you know, before the computers kill us all, there will be this beautiful moment of being able to use Hoon like very, very easily. And I think we're sort of explicitly targeting like, I guess, 2024 should be the year and then 2025 will all be dead. So it'll be fun, though. We'll be programming in Hoon and Rich, but then dead soon after. So this is one thing I didn't think I was going to this has not actually been on my mind for a while, but I have thought about it a little bit in the past. So the topic of like AI, and if you have like AI becoming like super powerful, um, to me, it feels like because in Urbit, you know, you are kind of like owning your own like network identity. um, And because you have, this sort of like governance structure, because in Urbit you have the the Senate, right? Basically you have a bunch of nodes, like 256 nodes that make up this galactic Senate and they are basically like a DAO, like a governance council, right? And these are people who own basically this cryptographic identity and then can make some decisions. So one thought I've had with regards to AI is that this feels like something that could be a pretty resilient structure that like, you know, human beings could keep control of even in the face of like AI becoming like super powerful. So I'm, I'm just curious, like what are your thoughts with like AI becoming, uh, you know, AGI and those kind of things and like how that will sort of like interplay with Urbit as a, as a network and as an alternative to the internet? So there's so many possible futures there that it's hard to catalog them. I think the only thing that's clear now is that absent maybe massive government or self-imposed like private uh, restriction, um, AI is going to get very powerful. I would, uh, and like already, especially in the area of programming is much more than people thought. So then you sort of play that out. And I think there's like these different futures where you know, maybe very powerful models are out there, but they're only owned by a few corporations in the US. And so then maybe Urbit plus crypto becomes this platform for people who want to, you know, access powerful AI models outside of that or have them like, you know, interact in that way um, and run sort of these alternative economies like outside of that. Uh, If, you know, AI is restricted, heavily, which is very possible in terms of like, you know, size of training runs, like GPUs being restricted in some ways, not not at all inconceivable. You know, then I think Urbit has this, and especially Ukbar has this massive role to play where uh, because in that, if AI is restricted, it's very hard to make all these systems work together. AI enabled Ukbar would be one of the best ways to have a large computer system that does work together, you know, for economic purposes, rich applications, uh, easy for developers to make, all of that stuff. Um, And, you know, then you do have like sort of these weird futures like where uh, AI gets super powerful, models are out there for everyone. Um, You know, in that, in those cases, I don't even know how like if humanity survives, we'd have to, you know, we'd have to see. But I think there's a broad range of outcomes where AI-assisted Urbit is very, very powerful for letting people, I guess, like access the, you know, the products of the products of models to assist their programming and also to like make throwaway programs that operate like in their orbits and orchestrate their stuff related to, you know, crypto applications, things like that. And then possibly things like training, but it's when there's this much uncertainty, I think the main thing you have to do is make sure that you're you kind of lean into the power and make sure you can do enough in all of those scenarios. And so I do know like at Ukbar, we're taking this very, very seriously as a kind of bull case for Urban in general, and especially for like Ukbar with uh, crypto being on Urban. Um, and just trying to make sure that, I, I guess there's this thing you could do of like making excuses where you're, where you say like, where people fall back into a sort of Urban pure, like, uh, purity thing of like, okay, we're Urbit, we don't use AI. And to me, that's, um, 
and we just, you know, do hand crafted artisanal programming, like, you know, ourselves or something, right? Um, to me, that's a lot less interesting than saying uh, we have this really powerful integrated system. The biggest barrier to its adoption was that the programming language is a little bit weird. Now we have machines that can just knock that out for us. And so that's a little bit scary because you're definitely going in the direction of making some very powerful systems. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think there's sort of any other way to go. From your description, it feels a lot like the Ukbar system can be thought of in the best case as similar to, to Apple, right? All of us have this experience that when you buy into the Apple ecosystem, you get one device and then the next device becomes Apple and then you're kind of trapped into like 10 devices inside the Apple ecosystem. And if, like, God forbid, you ever need an Android device and interoperability <laughs> is going to be really bad. So do you think, do you think that that's kind of like the future for Ukbar when it's successful that if I'm an Orbit user and I'm an Ukbar user, um, I'll have a very good experience when I am interacting with just Ukbar, having all my finances there, et cetera. But if you consider the other cases, which is like a developer that's kind of, I don't know, building on the Cosmos SDK and trying to ship to a trying to ship their Cosmos SDK application to a user that is on Orbit, uh, that interoperability may be very weak. Is uh, it the, is it, how okay. do you solve it? All right, because there's a few different cases embedded in your question. And so we should, like one is do, like sort of, do, if Ukbar is successful, does it sort of take over lots of computing? Um, and then the other one is if there's stuff outside of Ukbar's exact settlement system, how does it work in that? And so those are those are pretty different. Let's start with the second one, which is the Cosmos SDK developer who has, I don't know, maybe like an EVM compatible app or something like that done on it using like their own um, consensus system, right? I think in that scenario, what happens is because they're only building the consensus portion um, and the blockchain portion on Cosmos, um, a world in which Ukbar was very successful would be one in which developers were very used to uh, developing these urban applications, uh, in which users were very used to like installing and using them. And we could try to imagine, but let's imagine that like for whatever reason that developers Cosmos SDK application has become very popular, like running outside of that. I think it's very likely that someone will, which might even be us, will make a very strong, let's say, EVM compatibility layer where if someone has substantial assets and or like interactions they need to do with an outside, an outside chain, that they can do it actually in a similar way to how Ukbar does. Uh, which is, you know, you have some kind of like, you know, node reading that chain. You can do read and write um, or some kind of like graph style indexing through there. Um, and I think there would be a lot of economic incentive for that to get built. But I do think that it is the case that in that world, unless the developer was like deploying something that really needed its own consensus uh, or that was like a legacy application that needed to get deployed there, uh, in that world where Ukbar was that successful, they would probably deploy it on, you know, in Ukbar town. That said, I do think that like sort of already written and audited EVM type code will be with us for a while. And so I would expect at some point there will be some like compatibility layers that make that ingestible in Urbit where maybe you're not writing new contracts and deploying them, but you are getting other ones. Now, the other one though, you correctly, you know, got our goals, which is if Ukbar is successful, it will accrue lots of network effects, like sort of Apple style. Um, we try to mostly have, in terms of our economics, uh, have the way that we monetize that most be them like people transacting on the, like, you know, using the Ukbar chain. Um, and we try to make everything else like very, very open, like the application. So, you know, while I, you know, while becoming Apple would be a great outcome financially, I think um, we do have a bit of a different ethos because we have a different way to monetize. And so everything we've done so far in terms of like, you know, chat stuff, the things we're doing with DAOs, um, social like groupings, things like, like, uh, 
social applications coming out. Uh, we've made all that open because the entire goal is just for people to use Ookbar in a way that like, and also, um, you know, I guess to, to some degree that would also, to, if we were settling on it, then like flow through uh, to Ethereum somewhat as well. We'd see which assets were used on the thing, but we are trying to build very, very strong network effects in Ookbar and have that be the place where you go and have that also make urban apps like sort of the go-to apps. And this is why I sort of mentioned um, the AI angle, because I think without that to assist developers and also to make it easy for like really easy for users to make these sort of throwaway programs that can just operate on all these, you know, Ookbar urban APIs in their life. I think it's a little bit it's harder to imagine that future happening. Obviously, until recently, we were trying to make that future happen. Uh, but I think um, AI really increases the odds that we can, you know, that we can do such a thing. So I have always imagined, right, that the way Urbit would work is that Urbit as a whole would be this sort of like Apple-like system, right? Because you have this fundamental thing like the networking identity stuff that's like unified and like everything will kind of work together like that. But then I, I think what we have seen interestingly is that actually, and I, I don't, well, so you have like some companies that now have built more of, and I think pursuing a more of a philosophy of this kind of like, you know, vertically integrated stack that like all works well yeah. with each other. And, and, you know, for example, there's a whole bunch of different chat apps on, uh, on Urbit now, and they're like, you know, separate chat apps, right? So if I, if I'm like messaging, you know, with you, Demark, right? And then on one app, then it's going to, and, and I'm messaging the same username, right? Uh, like you on another app, then it's like on separate conversations. So where do I think that's going or how do I want it to, how do I want it to go? Yeah, I mean, my, actually, I, I, so I would sort of, sort of say that like my impression of Ookbar is much more that it's much more trying to be this like thin transaction layer of like, you know, uh, basically covering like the smart contract portion and then sort of you know because i think that's the other that's so a little bit the other approach right you can say like okay i'm we're going to try to build like some some component and then you know lots of other people can build and stuff versus like being this building this kind of vertically integrated full stack thing that it that ends up being a sort of like walled garden a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So we're very uninterested in the walled garden. We very much like that vision of Urbit as this like open system that a lot of, you know, that a lot of different applications can build on and compose. And one reason we're sort of we try to make our own programs that maybe look a little bit vertically integrated when we sort of don't see something out there that does what we want. So like we did do our own chat that we use uh, just because there wasn't anything else like that good out there. Um, and I think when we drop the next version of like where it includes groups, like on-chain DAO type structures, I think people will see that. But our goal is not to be like, you know, a vertically integrated chat company. Uh, we're mostly just trying to, I think we see this moment in Urbit's life where a lot of these uh, primitives and protocols haven't been made. And instead of like trying to round people up and make a standard and tell them they all have to follow our standard, we've just been like, okay, let's try to get the best thing out there that we can. If people start using it and we can build on it easily, that's great. Uh, we do try to leave them so that they're very, very open. So actually a great example of this is we have like multiple other projects now building with our chat primitives, with some of our social graph and like grouping primitives. And we actually do work to sort of support them and make those happen because it's not, again, it's not really interesting to us to have that be in there. It's just that we think that that base layer of primitives extends beyond just the chain. And we have to do a little bit of work to get other stuff out there, which actually... It makes sense if you think about what we've been saying this whole time, which is that we just want richer dApps. To, if they're not there, uh, we have to show people them. And we're seeing a lot of people get interested specifically because of things that we've made and then want to build richer dApps. And that's mostly what we want. But in the that's the short term and maybe medium term. In the medium to long term, I want, you know, Urbit to be its own kind of walled garden. But for that inside that walled garden to be uh, very, very open and for that to be this like, you know, universal computing system which isn't 
it's not that crazy to think about uh, because everything else is so centralized and hard to build on and compose, which is sort of another topic we could hit if necessary. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the fascinating thing in a way is that you can have both, right? You can have people build like a vault garden type system on Urbit, which is, is going to happen. And then you can have others build kind of open system and, and everything runs on the same OS. I think the walled gardens, they'll be under pressure, including the ones that like, you know, the things we're making that are internal. I think at some point, some of them will get popular. They'll become open standards. People will fit like build their own, like let's say front ends for accessing, you know, the chat apps that are dominant, the, those. And we're just so early that people in Urbit have tried to do it. Like for a while, it was like this social thing where someone would start building maybe a new app like in chat and people are like, oh, but don't you know Tlon is making that or this other group is? Uh, or something like that. And after a while, we're like, this is stupid. We're so early. It's just people like, you know, a, a couple hundred people fighting over this. Let's just like build it and still, like let that process happen. So let's, uh, let's talk about another topic. Uh, so it's kind of like another big topic. So you guys decided to build a roll up. I guess another path would have been to build basically like a sort of layer one orbit chain. What was the reason why you guys decided to go the roll-up path and not to build a L1? To pump my ETH bags. <laughs> um, <laughs> nah, the, the reason was it lets us, when we understood our core value proposition, better, which is about this, like being able to enable these like very rich applications, better experiences for developers and users. Uh, you start wanting to focus everything on that as long as possible. And if we did our own chain with our own consensus, uh, initially, we would have a couple issues right off the bat, uh, which are fine. And other chains kind of validly want to do those right off the bat. But for us, they weren't as interesting, which is one, you have to build your validator set and like get that, you know, get that all going. Um, and another is that you do have to bridge if you want to get in assets from other ecosystems. And so, which again, you know, it's fine. It's a valid choice. I have, there have been a number of issues with security of that. And there's, so there's challenges in doing it, but it's, you know, people do it. And it was just, we didn't want to, if we don't do it as a roll up initially, then we have to spend more money and like take longer because we have to do all that stuff. We have to set up like things, facilities for bridging. We have to set up um, and, and be confident in sort of the game theory and security there. Uh, we have to like build validator sets and figure out like, you know, the economics of that plus like, you know, finding them. And the valid, like the validator approach lets us, sorry, the, the, the roll-up approach lets us just focus on okay, let's have this sequencer or set of sequencers that are running and that we can sort of just keep out of our mind while we're doing it, which has been great the last few months um, to be able to sort of hold that steady as we iterate on other things. Um, and I guess also I did have this kind of feeling back in early 2022 that roll-ups were going to get hotter and alt L1s were going to lose some of their premium just for purely sort of technical uh economic reasons which i think is like most you look at the you know the fully diluted valuations of uh the top like l2s or things that try to pretend they're l2s like polygon um you know they've generally done better than solana avax like you know luna rest in peace um so yeah and i think um in terms of the base layer and getting that right, I do think like Ethereum is doing really, really good work there. And I don't want to, um, you know, mess with that for the moment. Now, of course, there's the moment that will come along in every successful L2's life, like down the road, which is, okay, now you do have a lot of money on here. Uh, you are very successful. You very easily could build, you know, a validator set out of, you know, what your token is. Um does it make sense for you to keep rolling up to Ethereum? And I think anyone who says they can answer that, like, you know, one way or another right now is lying. And I think we absolutely could see, for example, like, you know, Arbitrum uh, or Op well, Optimism has their own stuff where they probably wouldn't, but like you could use um, Starknet, uh, have that decision down the road uh, and make that in that direction. Um, we're, it would be an, it would be a nice problem to have. 
to to think about where I think we would be doing really really well. And the first goal is just to get maximal like Ukbar uh, and urban adoption without distractions. So I'm I'm actually really happy that the sort of base roll up architecture has been, I guess like worked out enough now that it's kind of boring. And there isn't my, you know, I've gone over the various, you know, the literature, seeing what people are doing, and there's nothing very new or interesting in most cases, which is great. It's like somewhat commoditized and we can sort of just go to it slowly while knowing that'll be there as an option. And then if we're super successful, we can have those discussions down the road as will everyone else who is, you know, very successful with an L2. So uh, in, in going down the roll-up path, uh, of course, the massive branch point is between optimistic rollups, which ensure their security through game theory, and ZK rollups, which ensure their security through uh, zero knowledge cryptographic proofs. And you, you've chosen the ZK rollup path. So, sort of. Sort of. Okay. So, so, yeah, so tell us like what path you have chosen and kind of what are the major technical decisions or business decisions. You have you've taken on that path. ZK rollups, in my opinion, are obviously desirable in the long run because, as you said, you don't have to secure anything with game theory, which gives you a lot more options for things like data availability. Um, it, it's a lot safer to do various, let's say, like Validium type schemes where you're not writing the data to layer one Ethereum or whatever layer one you're doing if you're using ZK because now you, you have like sort of two pieces of game theory to get right. Uh, there, if you're trying to do an optimistic rollup that uses validiums, it's it's very hard and generally it hasn't been, you know, hasn't been done. Um, that said, um, zk stuff is advancing very fast, and if you put too much work into getting it all right right now, you can put in a lot of work and then find out that like one year later you wouldn't have had to put in nearly as much work for the same result, and so you've basically wasted a lot of time and money for something which isn't really our core value proposition, which is um, you know, creating this like developer user ecosystem uh, natively on Urbit. So the best balance we found for that so far is to have a progression that's kind of as rapid as we can make it. So first part of the progression is, you know what? Our value proposition is making this like Urbit developer user ecosystem. Um, we'll start our roll up on testnet in proof of authority mode. Like we just say, this is the state and this was the state transition then. But while we're architecting that, it's not like a dumb proof of authority where you just like write this new state and that's it. You also make sure to implement data availability at the same time. And also, you know, the various sort of mechanics of making sure that, you know, deposits and withdrawals work right and can be proven. And so that you can switch that to an optimistic mode. Now, if you go to an optimistic mode, then you have the question of like, do you turn your fraud proofs on? Like optimism still hasn't done that. Um, Arbitrum has, but with permissioning, but optimism is still proof of authority. Like just trust me, bro, but just with billions of dollars, um, which, is, which is fine. I actually get their reasoning, which is that their main value proposition is being this thing that can become an optimistic roll up um, and that like people trust it enough to be like, it's basically, a, you know, an Ethereum side chain that people like the tooling on. Uh, and that's good. That's, it's working for them. The thing we can do next though, a lot of progress being made on sort of urbit native ZK proofs. Uh, we did that internally uh, in Ukbar and then some of the guys doing that spun out to form Zorp, which is a separate corporation doing ZK proofs of like knock and hoon code. Um, and their stuff is going really, really well. And we talk to them a lot, we uh, work with them closely, and we'll probably be able to jump from, instead of going from proof of authority to optimistic, it's very likely we'll be able to jump straight to, I guess I would say, optimistic ZK, where it's optimistic. But instead of having a long challenge procedure for resolving a fraud proof, you just submit a ZK proof for the fraud proof. Uh, the reason you can do that when ZK might not be ready yet is that for if you're doing a typical ZK rollup, you have to prove every transaction. And so you need some, they need to be fast enough. You need to be doing those in like whatever it is, like a second per transaction, a tenth of a second per transaction, proving them fast enough. If you do this optimistic ZK thing, you only need to prove the batch um, when there's a problem. And so in that case, like if someone flags it and there's a problem, you actually could take like three hours to prove the batch of like, let's say a hundred transactions or a thousand transactions. And it's totally fine. In fact, it's a lot better from a game theory perspective because you then only need one on-chain transaction 
to prove it. So it's very, very likely that when we launch Ookbar on mainnet, it will probably be proof of authority, but ready to turn immediately to a um, ZK optimistic system. And then from there, it's literally just a matter of marching through the optimizations to get regular ZK uh, fast enough, which we're pretty, pretty optimistic on, but we're extremely optimistic on optimistic ZK. So this is all very pragmatic and it's just focused on how fast can we get people interacting with our core value proposition, which is this sort of urbit ecosystem where you're doing stuff on it for real money. Um, and we're probably more limited even by audits than by uh, ZK or Optimistic. And so what we'll probably do is that system I was talking about throwing out on mainnet probably early this summer. Um, we'll probably have it deposit limited where it can only take a certain amount of ETH or ERC 20s just so that, you know, people don't put in hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of TVL and then something happens and then GG Ukbar. Uh, I think we'll, you know, try to have it be like, okay, you should be responsibly putting on like, you know, a couple thousand dollars or something or whatever you can afford to lose. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of the way that we think about that. And the, the way to sum it all up is you have the technology and the game theory plus technical primitives. And you want to make that sort of maximally accelerate your core value proposition. And so when I see other L2s that are making decisions, like we said with optimism of not enabling fraud proofs yet, I actually don't hate on it at all. And I get exactly what they're doing, which is they can kind of see where things are going. They've also thought of, you know, going from optimistic to optimistic ZK, which makes sense. And they're just trying to like, you know, have that, make sure they do have a plan, at least in the long run to have it intersect. So, you know, our situation is very similar. It's just, we'll probably get to something secure, maybe faster, uh, minus audits. I have a question here in terms of like the finality. So if, if, if this optimistic ZK, if let's say, uh, in your example, you say, okay, maybe it can take three hours. I mean, I, I guess there's like some time needed for somebody to say, Hey, there was an issue with this transaction and then some time needed for like someone to, to create the proof and submit it. And, and then that is kind of like whatever window you have to sort of be able to live with that uh, until you have finality or like, how do you think of this sort of like, you know, the, the finality time that guarantees. So it obviously Z, pure ZK is the best because you can just be final uh, once you're on within whatever the batch time is that you're doing it um, for optimistic. People usually have done a week. Uh, the reason is that you often have to do multiple challenges. Like the way our Btrim does it is like a bisection thing where TLDR, you could maybe have to do 15, 30 uh, different transactions uh, to sort of complete the fraud proof. And so you have to make sure there's enough time, not just to find the fraud, but to get through all the transactions in an adversarial environment where someone might be doing the calculation of, I'm fine to DOS the Ethereum network with this many transactions and pay this much money because I'll be able to withdraw more than that from the roll up if it gets through in that window. If you have this like optimistic ZK, you only need one proof. And so that should reduce the finality window by a decent amount because you don't have to calculate it. So like the, you don't have to worry about them dosing it for like 15 to, you know, transactions. Uh, you only need one transaction to get through, but you know, off the top of my head, it would probably be more in like the, you know, one to three day range for final for finality on it. But even that would be, um, a little bit of a stopgap while we go to full ZK because I, just I don't really like the you know sort of multiple time finality. That said, within Ukbar, if you're talking about transferring from one Ukbar, like let's call them shard, we call them towns, to another, you can get faster. Like as long as you sort of trust that the main thing on chain won't get rolled back, you can let those uh, shards talk to each other pretty rapidly um, because you don't have to worry about if one gets rolled back, they all like they all get rolled back. Uh, but again, another good reason to get to ZK as soon as possible, but also worth keeping in mind that even if we got there tomorrow and had a full ZK system, we would still have to audit the rest of the system. So it's not sort of worth it. To, we're, we're trying to like make everything go together uh, a little bit later in the year, or early next year. So we can stitch a few things that you have mentioned together. Um, earlier in the episode, you talked about 
how the developer experience of Bookbar and Urbit will be the same or, or similar, which means people will be able to write smart contracts in Hoon and deploy them to Bookbar. And then later you mentioned that eventually you would like Bookbar to be a ZK rollup and in the short run, an optimistic ZK rollup where if something goes wrong on Bookbar, it can be proven on Ethereum that something went wrong. So if you put these two things together, it feels like the essential primitive that you need is for a developer to be able to write a program in Hoon and then have that program be executed somewhere and then generate a zero knowledge proof for the results of, the, of that program's execution. Because absent that primitive, Ukbar, Ukbar could neither be an optimistic ZK rollup nor, nor be a full ZK rollup in the yes. future. So how, and, and this is like a novel challenge, right? Like you have, you have the Hoon language, so you want to program in Hoon, you want to execute it somewhere, you need to generate a zero-knowledge proof uh, that, the, that the program's execution resulted in this particular result. So how are you solving that problem? That primitive. So specifically, like just executing the zero knowledge proofs. You have a transaction in Ukbar, and you need to do it. Meaning, meaning, how do you generate the proof, and how do you verify the proof, and how are you attacking the problem of you know de- building or developing a proof generator? Yeah, this is the answer is sort of boring, um, unfortunately. Which is for verifying the proof, there's pretty standard stuff that you can roll on with whatever system you're using um, to put it on to deploy it on Ethereum uh, and have it verify that. For generating the proof, this is where uh, we did a lot of sort of initial feasibility research and then uh, have some of that internally. But Zorp, uh, this other Urbit company, has made such fast progress on specifically proving Urbit programs of actually any kind, not just uh, Ukbar transactions, but since Ukbar transactions are Urbit programs, uh, they get those. And they've made such fast progress on that that we actually can just, we've, we've been you know negotiating uh, a deal with them, contingent on them getting it uh, working, which seems, well, I think we're going to be demoing the first version on today's Wednesday, I guess, on Friday. But literally, you throw in an Urbit program, uh, it spits out a proof. Uh, you throw in, you know, a thousand Ukbar transactions. Uh, it spits out a proof of those that you can use for this validation. And so, uh, while that answer is boring, uh, the implications of it are really interesting. Which is that not only will Urbit be this like place where you can write these rich applications that interact with the blockchain. There's one other thing that's sort of catnip or nerd snipey to blockchain programmers and people around that, which is the ability to do zero, like easy zero knowledge proofs. And we will likely have the ability to, ev- not just for your on-chain Ukbar transactions, but even stuff that happens off-chain that you want to prove, um, you know, make these proofs that something was done right. So an example of that off-chain would be and also you can verify on Ukbar. So we can deploy not just a program on Ethereum that can verify proofs, we can deploy a program on Ukbar that can verify these zero knowledge proofs. And so what that would look like is, imagine, I don't know, you have like a game world that someone enters and puts in assets in order to like do fights or something like that. And at the end of it, they just, uh, they need to like run a proof, run a prover on all of the actions they took and the code that happened and prove they followed the rules of that game world. And then they can, you know, withdraw more assets potentially or lose some, you know, depending on how it went. And I think there's this whole world of verifying computing uh, completely off chain stuff that happens and then using that to trigger on chain events, but having that be at consumer scale uh, that we're really, really excited about. So we would, there's actually these like two, the, the, the blockchain aspect is actually maybe the most basic and simple, which is literally we license um, you know, a thing from them. We probably do some kind of license where it's open for people to use as long as they just use it for Ukbar so they don't have the you know, Starkware problem of not being able to access the provers. Um, but then they have this whole other world of you know, they can go and you know, license proving or do proving um, that lets them do all of these arbitrary off-chain interactions that they can prove 
on chain that they followed some set of rules in order to un- like in order to unlock things. And so we're very excited about that. It's definitely something we want to market really heavily as this additional capability of Urbit programs. Um, but it were sort of just, we, we didn't know until very recently that it would happen. Basically the timeline was, it must've been March, maybe 13th, 14th. We had the conversations uh, with Zorp where we saw how far stuff was getting and how this would be a thing that we could also offer to Ukbar developers. Uh, you know, then we're thinking about that. Then all of the uh, GPT-4 stuff hit and we had to also think about AI at the same time and figure out like that strategy. Uh, but the, I don't want to downplay the the ZK side. It's like, one of the most interesting things happening on Urbit and like in Ukbar. And we think that, you know, kind of, if you liked uh, Stark, like Starknet, like you'll love, um, you'll love this because you can, everything you learn in terms of writing Hoon programs or having a computer write for you, uh, you will soon be able to just prove in ZK and it's really wild. And people aren't, don't really know about it yet. And we'll probably just have to show them in order for them to believe it because it's kind of a wild claim. So in the in the rest of the ZK ecosystem, there's broadly broadly like I'm not talking about Ukbar or Zor. Uh, there's broadly two two approaches to um, to building you know smart contract capable ZK systems. So one approach is that you develop your own virtual machine, which is different from the Ethereum virtual machine, has a different set of instructions. But you architect those instructions in a way that creating zero knowledge proofs is easier. And then you have some kind of domain specific language built to utilize that virtual machine. So the most famous example of this approach is, is, is Starknet, which virtual machine is different. And then the domain specific uh, language on top of it is, is Cairo, which is different from, from Solidity. And then, uh, so that's kind of one approach. And then the second second kind of approach is all of these projects that are trying to build a ZK, ZK EVM of, of sorts. So so this would this would be Polygon, but then there are uh, then there are other projects as uh, as well. Maybe three or four of them that are trying to build a ZK EVM, in which the virtual machine, the instructions of the virtual machine are the same as as Ethereum. And you're trying to develop a kind of prover that can kind of reuse those instructions and um, and, and, and and build and build the proofs. So, given that there are these two approaches, um, and you are you are just buy, you may just end up buying the technology of Zorb. Um, what camp do you belong in, and what kind of constraints does that imply for the future? We're we're very we're very obviously in the alt VM like uh, Starknet type approach where we're not like making our smart contracts EVM because we have a good reason not to, which is that we want them to be maximally integrated in Urbit. Um, so that's that decision sort of already made for us. And then the fact that you know parties like Zorp are making a lot of progress on proving those native Urbit transactions makes everything pretty smooth. In terms of ZK EVM, I think it's important to just say how I think about the EVM in general, uh, because it's been very successful. It's very widespread. There's a lot of audited code uh, that runs on it for like large amounts of money. And I think about it's going to sound negative if I say this, but I mean it in a very positive way. It's a lot like COBOL, where you have like lots of, uh, and Fortran, where you have like a lot of code that runs billions, trillions of dollars that runs on COBOL still like for banks. Uh, they know it works. Uh, they use it. It's hard to find, you know, people who want to like program on it or do it, but it's, you know, it's there. And that's going to be with us for some amount of time. And I think that the EVM is very similar. And so I think that steps towards having given that, that we're going to have EVM code with us for some time, managing billions of dollars, whether it's on, you know, Ethereum, Cosmos, obviously Avalanche did that like heavily, but everyone who uses the EVM wants access to those programs. Um, Given that we need ZK EVMs because this is better than the optimistic setup and those projects are all making great progress there. And I think it will eventually work. I think we could we could see things even like successful or wealthy uh, optimistic projects like Optimism or Arbitrum switch to ZK because I think it's getting very commoditized. Uh, I would actually expect to see that. Polygon's sort of leading the way there in terms of just trying to go directly to that. 
Um, so for us, like, it's just a different universe. I think the most likely universe, if Ukbar wins and if EVM code is still running, is that we'll have we'll probably sponsor or work with some projects to make a clean interface for ingesting EVM data from the most popular uh, L2s or L1s into uh, Urbit like Ukbar programs. And you know, then people, you know, if they have some multisig with like you know, tens of millions of dollars that they just, for what they want to have on Gnosis, um, you know, they can, they can do that. But as far as we go, um, there's no reason for us to, it would be, it would be a lot more work to make our thing EVM compatible uh, and ZK provable in the EVM. And at the end of it, our payoff would be that people had to write, you know, Solidity or similar programs inside Urbit, which we, you know, don't really want it all. So, you know, we want to have our own thing, get maximum adoption for our alt VM settling to Ethereum, and then later on do the work to be, you know, be able to ingest and write to EVM contracts on other chains for sure. Which I guess also sort of addresses your question from earlier about the poor, you know, Cosmos SDK developer with a popular chain who has his thing. That, that's sort of the answer for him is that if it's EVM compatible, we would likely uh, do the work to make it, you know, ingestible from his as long as he used like standard tooling. And so this alt alt VM that your stack is based on is it is it the same alt VM as as Starkware or a, no a we alt no 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 so no we that's an Urbit no it's Urbit yeah it's just like a normal RVM is an Urbit program it's like maybe a thousand lines of code it's not very big it's like it sits there uh, it takes in transactions that are Urbit data. Um, in the in the normal form, it processes them with a, an engine written in Urbit, and it spits out Urbit data on the other end that we can then serialize for posting data availability on a Validium or to Ethereum. And uh, because of that, we're that's why we're able to take like let's say a zk proving solution that wasn't developed for Ukbar in particular, like Zorps, which is just for proving Urbit code in general, and say we have Urbit code, uh, prove this. And it should, you know, should just work. The only, the, um, for people who want to get really technical, I don't want to bore your listeners, but Urbit has these things called jets, which basically, if you have some piece of code, it processes them faster uh, using maybe essentially a foreign function interface. Um, and, and in those cases, you have to make, you, you have to decide on what your set of jets is. Uh, for the ZK prover of like beforehand and sort of say, I'm proving a transaction, assuming the existence of these jets, but I don't want to go too far in there. The basic message is you have, you know, we, our, our engine, our VM is just Urbit code and uh, we prove Urbit code. When we were using Starkware's products uh, back in the summer, what we were doing was using them to essentially write Urbit interpreters. So we would write a program in Cairo in Starkware's language that would take in Urbit code and prove and generate proofs that it was done right according to Urbit's rules. Uh, but, you know, cutting out the middleman to some degree and having a more native system for it is probably going to be beneficial. If we had to go back to that, you know, we could. But it's, it's unlikely at this point. Cool. So one question sort of as, as we get towards the end. So one question I'm curious about when it comes to use cases, that you want to see people build and that like, you know, you're most excited about and that you think would be, you know, the things that will really leverage Ukbar and Urbit's capabilities, you know, the best and that, that are kind of going to be the things that can really like take off in the next year, two years. Uh, are, are there particular things you have in mind? Do you have a sort of list of like things I want to see built? Yes. Uh I want to say that we need to see them develop to like kind of make our imagination go further. But I think everything in the world of social, but social meaning everything like related to, you know, networks where you're posting information and having stuff come in and communicating with people. DAOs are an example, discords, um, everything in there we want to ingest. Uh, everything like then that can um, in the social plus like game type world i think is really is really interesting like and um and we're actually talking with some like game projects to onboard them because one of the best things that we can provide is this like you know just sort of full crypto plus social plus you know chatting etc integration into there 
I guess one way I would say it is that right now, a lot of Urbit people just for coordinating their development use stuff like gather.town where they can go on and like chat with each other and have like, you know, some environments to like go play with. I'd like to see stuff like that, but much, much richer. I'd like to see things like what people use um, Twitter, Discord, other social for, um, but much, much, like much, much richer um, and DAO like in it. The thing that we're not going for as much from the start is the typical thing that people do when they launch a chain, which is try to, you know, copy, like, you know, make some AMM clones and get a lot of liquidity. Yeah. Yeah, Everyone clones (laughs) Lunacy Software and and, like does it. And we have one guy who's like, has clone, like made an AMM just like, you know, for the hell of it. Cause like we can, and it's on there, but we're, we're exactly interested in getting people doing these much more um, social type game type applications um, seeing how those actually inter- integrate with crypto in like a richer environment. Um, and then once there's demand for it doing the liquidity type stuff, because I think it's, yeah, it's not our, it's a thing we want to be doing eventually, but it's not the new interesting thing in crypto. The other way of saying that is that everyone in crypto sort of knows that just doing Uniswap clones is kind of a dead end and not very interesting. And we're trying to create, uh, you know, this new, this new meta, like this, like just much, much richer set of things that you can do. Um, and we don't even know fully what that looks like, but we have, it's also not just a blank slate. So we're like, okay, I wish we had chat so that we can do these things and see where it goes. Then once we had chat, we're like, oh, now we actually can do basically groups, DAOs, discords, like things like, um, much more like that um, with crypto. And then I think we'll see what the, ne- you know, what the next thing is after, but there's a, some other projects that we're working with uh, that will, you know, add those. I think uh, one that we were interested in was like what portal was doing, which was trying to make like a discoverability thing for everything in all the content in Urbit. And that has a lot of obvious crypto integrations. And so I, I think, like in terms of incentivizing people to do stuff for it, um, you know, limit, you know, limiting things in various ways, letting people collect assets. And so I'm interested to see how that goes. But just just in general, like, I guess the idea of making those applications, but then letting people extend them easily is something we haven't seen a lot since the, I don't know, probably since the late 2000s. Um, like Facebook, like Twitter, open API APIs phase when people could just sort of build whatever applications they want integrated into those. And we want to bring that back to some, like to some degree. Cool. Fantastic. Maybe like final question. What's the, what did, what do the timelines look like? Uh, where are you at right now? What are the main milestones coming up? Um, right now, we are in the process of finishing our main engine, integrating it with ZK, at least for optimistic ZK, and doing the basic version of the rollup. We have a very basic version on testnet, but even need to add stuff like withdrawals. Um, we also, we talked about a little bit about which we call Ziggurat, which was basically the thing that's going to let you um, pull together all of, you know, developing for lots of Urbit nodes at once, checking that against the Utbar chain, doing all of that. That will be out in users' hands probably later this month or in May, and then we'll start iterating it fast based on that. We would like to then go to mainnet probably in June or July, um, where you're sort of doing stuff for real money, but deposit limited, and start doing you know audits of our code around then, having people get familiar, auditors get familiar with our Hoon engine, also the on-chain, the on-chain portion. And as the summer, you know, as the summer goes, we'll be doing more experiments with um, AI to like enable Hoon programming. But and in terms of having like the actual chain launched with like sort of full tools and everything working, that'll be like probably the alpha beta version over the summer. And then as the year goes on and we do audits, we'll get closer to doing stuff like potentially lifting. Um, any caps on, you know, the amount of deposits really going after developers very hard, things like that. So I would look for some action if you're sort of really into, if you're into Urbit development already or want to get into it um, this spring, like around May. And then the real, you know, hardcore, lots of apps are coming out um, and we're moving closer and closer to, you know, no training wheels uh, over the summer and fall. 
Cool. That's exciting. Yeah. I mean, yes, I think a lot of fast. things going, yeah, a lot of things going on in Urbit, a lot of things going on in Nookbar, things moving fast. So I, I think it's, it's going to be pretty mind blowing. I think the sort of experience, the user experiences people are going to be able to like enjoy in this world, you know, in sort of, I think, you know, next year, maybe towards the end of this year or some things, but I think definitely next year it's going to be something where I think a lot of crypto people will go and be like, that's what I expected it should work like. And that's, that's what I've been kind of waiting for. Uh, One thing we say internally, that's, it's very much like, Ukbar can make ICOs great again Um, in the sense of like when people were saying all these things over, you know, 2016, 2017, it was based on this idea that we have this global consensus engine. We can do all these crazy things with it. And for a variety of reasons, obviously there were like, you know, the issues with, you know, scams and things like that, but also there were like people who were trying to do ambitious things and they were just too hard then. And I think they're now finally in reach. And so, you know, ideally we could make another ICO boom happen and everyone will be happy with us. But like that, that's kind of that's kind of the vibe. Perfect, cool. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Tim Luck. It was really great to have you on. It was great to talk about Ukbar. Super excited about the project and where it's going to go. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Really fun. Great questions. And thanks for listeners for tuning in. We're going to be back next week, and have a great week.